We're very lucky and uh, it's just great to have uh, Nader back here at Georgia Tech. Um, he's, really, he's really kind of an ex a part of our extended family. Um, I mean, I think there, there are a few names that come up as often as his name does in studio or just talking to faculty because he's had such an impact on our school over the years. Um, first, probably as the Vigilette Chair back in, I did write this down, 2005, I think. That's a long time ago. Um, and I think when he was here, he, he made a big impact on the school in a short amount of time. I think he made a big impact on the students and the faculty. I mean, I can't tell you, Nadir, how many times I've talked to faculty who really speak fondly Thank about you. your time here. And, and I know a lot of, a lot of them have stayed very close to you uh, since that time. Um, and for those students who don't know this, and please don't even admit this if you don't know it, but he designed the building that you work in. Um, <laughs> I, I, with LAS, I see Jack Hyrie back there. This uh, building? Well, Which one? What's that? Which one? The Hyman building. Oh, that one there? Yes. You're, you get an excuse because you're not an architecture student or faculty. Right? Yeah, but most of the students, I think, know that. Um, and, uh, and the other thing about that building, I mean, it's, 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 it's one of these buildings, in some ways you could say it was kind of a, a modest project, you know, it was kind of an intervention as much as anything else into, a, into quite an amazing space, but, but it has, it was probably designed this way, but it certainly has become almost like a teaching tool for students. And I can't, again, I, I can think of many times when I walk in there and I just look at the details, I look at the materials, I look at how, how just intelligent the interventions were and the impact that it had on that space and how it's made it just a great place to to be in, a great place to teach in, a great place to, for the students to work in. So, um, you know, I don't know how, how big, a, a, how, how much more of an impact you can have on a school than to actually design the space that the students work in. Um, so Nadir, um, I'm not going to go into a lot of background information, you can read about this, but he founded um, Office Doc uh, in the mid 80s, and this firm immediately became uh, very well established, very reputable. I can think of exhibitions at MoMA. I can think of great projects they did in, in, in those days. That transitioned into NADA in 2011. Um, and I think for the beginning, in, in both kind of iterations of his firms, they've always worked at a really wide range of scales. I think even now, I think Nader still fasc is fascinated with this, the detail, you know, furniture, uh, products, you know, every aspect of a building is really taken into account. And one of the things that strikes me when I think, think about their work is like nothing's taken for granted. Like a handrail, you know, a guardrail, a wall, nothing's taken for granted in terms of, well, that's just a wall, or that's just this or that. Everything is kind of thought through in an incredible way and kind of reinvented every time. Uh, and, and I was when I was going back through all your projects, and I, you know, I know your work very well. But when I would, it was just amazing how every time I would see something, it was like again, I was th I'm thinking about handrails. Your, the handrails and guardrails on the <laughs> stairs are just like, how many times can you reinvent that? And every time it's more beautiful than the last time. And that attention to just to detail and just to a sensibility about craft and material. Uh, is super refreshing. I mean, it's odd to say that now, but it's refreshing because I'm not sure that that's on, in the forefront of the minds of architects today, but it, it definitely is in their work, and it, it's just, it's, it's really quite, quite amazing. Um, so, their work has been recognized widely. Um, I mean, they have some of the most uh, prestigious awards uh, that an architect can get from the Cooper Hewitt um, uh, National Design Award to the American Academy of Arts and Letters Architecture Award. They have 17 Progressive Architecture Awards. Now for students who don't really know what that is, that, that's a, I think that's probably one of the most prestigious annual award that architects can get. And it's been going on for a very long time. And, and, um, and uh, Nadir's office has this reputation of winning every year. Um, and I look back, and since 1995, they've won at least one award every year, I think, except five years. So it's 22 years, and you've only not won an award five times, and that is pretty hard to do because the best projects in the country get entered into this award. So it's not only just that they've won these awards, but the consistency and the quality of the work over time is, is, is just really, really admirable. Um, and I, I will say this kind of personal thing. For, 
I'm a practicing architect, and, and I think architects, oftentimes when you're working on a project and you get stuck, you'll say, okay, I gotta, I gotta get out of this, you know, whose work do I look at? And, and Nadir's work is one of the few firms that I can say in our office that we look at when we get into those ruts. Like, how do we get out of this? And we will look at their work and it helps us to be better architects. So I think the impact that he has on other architects is, is quite, quite profound. Um, he also teaches. He does more than teach. He runs schools. Uh, he uh, was the head of the MIT uh, School of Architecture for four or five years from uh, uh, 20, what is it, 2010 to 2014. And he's currently the dean uh, at Cooper Union. Uh, and from everything that I can tell and hear and see, he's doing an incredible job at a school that had an unbelievable legacy to kind of, to, to kind of follow. And I think if there was anybody who could take that school, I mean, John Haydick led that school for many years. And, I don't know if students know who John Haydick is, but one of his sculptures was built full scale in our atrium for, for several years. So he, he, an incredibly impactful architect and educator. And he built Cooper Union uh, over the course of I don't know how many years. And to follow that is not easy to do. And, but Nadir has done that. And I think he's like evolving and taking the school to another level. So I'll stop talking. Um, but please join me in welcoming the dare back home to your second home uh, here at Georgia Tech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can't think uh, of a more uh, generous uh, welcoming than that. Uh, thank you all for being here, uh, friends and family and so forth. Um, and yes. Uh, the Ventula chair uh, was a critical moment um, uh, in our career and, and has a lot to do with what I will speak about tonight because effectively um, there were two strands of work uh, at play at the same time. But one had to do with the detail as a generator as a precondition for architectural action. Uh, and that will be featured heavily on one of the walls in the exhibition um, upstairs. Uh, and the other one had to do with this fortuitous moment, being down here and somehow uh, with LAS partnering up for the possibility of the Hinman building at a time when uh, the economy was crashing, uh, undertaking at that same time 14 competitions, four of which we won, three of which were schools of architecture. And so the other wall uh, and the sort of suspended structure, the, the mini-me of the, the hammock, uh, uh, displays the schools of architecture in relationship to uh, an article that I'm developing now, which has to do with the relationship of schools of architecture as places, as forms, as, as, uh, as typologies on the one hand, and the kinds of mentalities and schools of thought they engender, and whether there's a connection between the two. Uh, and certainly, being at Cooper Union right now in the foundation building, uh, a historic building that has gone through many renovations, four of them, uh, the most uh, famous of which is by John Haydock in the 70s, uh, remains so profound uh, in its memory that I have to battle that ghost on a daily basis. So uh, architecture uh, entails a, a great many things. Uh, you know, the study of cities, uh, urban connections, uh, typological transformations, building technologies, and a range of discussions we can have. Uh, and the prospect of reducing all of that to one discussion seems improbable, but that is what I'm gonna do tonight. I want to talk about a microscopic thing which has to do with the telltale detail and its relationship with the, the kind of grain that it produces, and that grain is a, is a word that you have used often. It's a grain of wood, 
Uh, it's, it's the grain of a city. So it's a metaphor for those things that produce pattern and texture. But they're important because um, uh, though we take these grains for granted in nature, uh, it is only when we see images like this one that we're reminded of the artifice of that grain. This is, in fact, the way that the organization of the form of the zebra in relationship to its skin uh, is, is actually uh, organized. In other words, that the stripes are uh, going around the torso, but so too they're going around the legs, forcing that turning of the corner uh, at that juncture. Uh, the architecture, in my mind, happens at that juncture. Uh, you know, the pattern is, is the rule, but that turning of that corner is, is important. But it's also important to recognize that as architects, uh, we are in charge of the artifice of that striping. Uh, we produce that grain, sometimes working with the natural grain of materials and sometimes going against them. Uh, but let's not fool ourselves. What we do uh, engenders a kind of the agency of an artificial act. As we look at uh, the natural world also, the world of wood, let's say, uh, we also understand that there's differences in the optimization of certain cuts, like a plane sawn uh, cut, a riff sawn cut, uh, or the quarter sawn. And based on the kind of grain you want to get, you understand the fundamental dif differences between these two as you look for the veneers that you're trying to get. And such was the case when we were designing this little table, uh, we were interested in the massive and structural predispositions of end-grained wood, in this case, plywood compressed with each other, bolted together to become a sturdy compressive structure. What is interesting, of course, about uh, plywood uh, as it's laminated together is that strided condition that it produces, which is akin to a quarter-sawn grain of wood. So in combination with walnut uh, on the opposing edge and uh, zebra wood on the underbelly, you begin to see a dialogue between uh, you know, uh, three sets of grains that turn the corner uh, on the vertical axis uh, right here, mirroring a kind of oblique symmetry uh, uh, about that, ta uh, that table. This, I will speak a little bit later to the Parthenon, uh, and you may appreciate that, but the problem really is, of course, is that as you go, as the, as the belly wraps up, you can never get across this perpendicular grain as they come together. It's a kind of historic challenge that nobody has been able uh, to, um, to uh, legitimately uh, overcome. And that is what I'm interested in. But I'm also interested in those moments of figuration, the escape from configuration, as it were. As you cut away at the legs, you begin to discover another grain. And that other grain produces the, uh, you know, the discovery of an organicity that uh, is very much part of another aspect of our work. The turning of that corner, of course, you all know in uh, Bramante's court, uh, in Santa Maria de la Pace, uh, I still haven't found uh, the excerpt or the historical excerpt that describes whether this was negligence or, or, uh, or a joke. Uh, but it, it's kind of a wonderful moment when you begin to see the order swallowed up at that corner where the capital is ingested by the... Uh, by the wall mass. And, and it, it really requires a generation to Palladio to displace the, the relationship of that pilaster in order that uh, you are allowed to turn the corner. So lest you think that these uh, corner conditions are new, uh, they're very much part of an ongoing dialogue with history itself. So in the Rock Creek House, uh, we were confronted with a situation of dealing with a a uh, Neo-Georgian structure of two floors with an attic as well as a basement that opens out onto a lower level garden. So in, in effect, uh, uh, a growing family of uh, you know, 
mother, father, and two kids has another kid and a nanny, a dog, a this and a that, and they want not to move away from the neighborhood. So at all costs, they want to stay there and expand up and down. So the task that we had at hand was to maintain the general grain and character uh, uh, of this Neo-Georgian structure, but radically change its functionality, connecting the top story all the way down to the basement, uh, but also opening up the south uh, so that you could get maximum light all the way through the building and into the north. And to do that, of course, is, is not an easy task because as you begin to open up these windows, at a certain moment, the figure-ground relationship between void and solid is so extreme that you, effectively you're making a brick curtain wall. And so what's interesting about the structure is, in effect, it's a monolithic brick uh, building that changes state as it goes from one side to the other. It goes from load-bearing to a curtain wall on the opposing side. But also what's interesting is that it, conceptually it's a landscape project. The brick that is used to make the attic space is excavated from the windows that used to be on the south, or the wall that used to be on the south uh, producing uh, that thing. So there's a kind of uh, perfect net to gross relationship between the two, and we could cut and fill it without using any extra brick. The plan typologically is also uh, pretty straightforward with uh, four stories, always load-bearing, as you can see on the north side, and an open free plan on the south. And we take advantage of that to establish uh, these vertically strided load-bearing brick walls, almost producing a party wall condition all the way to the south, intercepting the facade that is uh, essentially suspended as a curtain wall to the south, and because of a, an unfortunate commitment to a contractor, uh, the best friend of the client and a neighbor, we realized that this house will never get built correctly. So if we can find a way to develop a furnishing strategy, a millwork strategy that is the entire building, uh, that we will co-opt essentially the scope of work to the point where nothing can go wrong because the mill worker is our neighbor and our best friend. So, <laughs> so uh, the grain of the wood and the grain of the brick are ostensibly going in the same direction. With a section of the building, uh, uh, the only part of the section of the building that we're ostensibly operating on is this vertical atrium that connects you to the attic where the kids play, to a second level where the kids do their homework, and to the lower floor, which becomes the summer living room connecting to the to the swimming pool area, and the Piano Nobile, which is the winter living room. And the entire building comes together at this point. The graining of which produces a situation that the blades of the plywood draw all of the light to the northern edge of the building, while maintaining a solidity on the east and west, such that there's not even any doors. These are all walls that slide back and forth to essentially hide the kitchen on the right and the family room to the left seamlessly uh, for those moments where there's a public affair. But this uh, uh, face-grained, end-grained condition then uh, it produces the condition, this kind of Piranesian rotation as you go up the stairs uh, and uh, bringing the house together, uh, the space from which everybody is screaming at each other. Uh, the connection to the basement then, the, 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 uh, the, the ground floor is another stair that winds to the side, a kind of organic space, a monolithic space uh, within which that striation uh, entails the uh, development of a railing uh, and using basically the, the language and the technologies that are adopted to embed uh, the light switches, the, the outlets, uh, and all of the fixtures with the corner condition again becoming the exceptional moment where the play of lightness and weight uh, is, is, uh, is, it comes to dialogue with each other. You can see in the plan that there's a, portion, a central portion uh, which is um, wider with the kind of periscoped areas on the east and west 
with the glazing coming and playing back and forth based on flushnesses and, um, and cantilevers uh, as, as might be. So the entire uh, project is about opening up to Rock Creek uh, and acknowledging the oblique connection to the garden, which is primarily to the east, and using the depth or the poche that is produced by this depth to inhabit the furnishings uh, of these edge conditions in chaise longue, in seats, and then taking advantage of that same grain to produce the door handles of these large doors that um, uh, allow for the movement of, uh, of these walls. If Rock Creek represents uh, the rarefied opportunity to build for wealth, then there are situations in which you get a rock bottom budget to do something extraordinary in a language to which you have no access. And so when confronted with the possibility of doing a model home gallery in Korea, uh, we sprung to the opportunity. Uh, we had no idea what this building type was, but we knew we wanted to build it. Uh, based on precedence, we realize that these are large and important public institutions that are spread throughout uh, Seoul and other major cities, only to realize that, in fact, all they are are sales offices. Every monolith that you look at on the top of the screen, uh, all this kind of figurative and spectacular work, are sales offices for apartment types that are then ingrained and embedded in massive housing projects all over the country. And the deal that is made, essentially, is that companies like uh, Ramian or Samsung or uh, uh, other such, Hyundai, all of these companies make deals with certain neighborhoods by bringing public amenities to the base of that building for that very community. And so conceptually, what they want is they want a spectacle on top uh, but they really want infrastructure at the bottom. So the diagram of the building that you can see to the right is really the, the monolith at the top. And for them, at all costs, this has to compete with the objectness of all of those other ridiculous buildings and, uh, and the porosity and the openness that is represented by the base. Now, please keep in mind that I'm presenting this project as an important contribution to the argument about tectonic rain, never for a moment deceiving myself into thinking that this is a good project. It's a bad project, I acknowledge, but it's an important one uh, uh, to, to learn a certain type of lesson from. And the lesson that we learned was that if you don't speak the language, if you don't have access to the site, and if it produces incredible budgetary problems, why don't you reduce it to four details? And so if you can get those four details correct, it may yet survive in some way or another. Uh, the project uh, site that we discovered uh, as we went there was this barren landscape with a park to the right-hand side that was embellished by a subway station, uh, making possible for massive development to the left. Uh, and we thought that the phasing of this project, of course, would take... Uh, you know, years to fulfill. But by the second visit that we'd come here, the entire zone to the left was absolutely filled. We also got started on the working drawings very fast and submitted it by, I believe, sometime in October, November, or something like that. And we never heard from them again. And the next time we heard from them, that was the image we got from them. Uh, and they said, you know, we're, we're having problems turning the corner. And... <laughs> Uh, could we re-engage re you to, to come over and, and help us to you know, figure out a way to do it? Naturally, we'd been working digitally and with software, and so we'd imagined a level of engagement with uh, CNC software, but all of this is done manually uh, and with Chinese labor uh, and on this uh, incredible schedule that involves a 24-hour uh, labor, and it's very difficult. And so uh, this project was effectively done uh, between myself, uh, you know, our Korean partner architect who had never done a building, had only done interiors, as well as the engineer on site, which was this extraordinary gentleman who never spoke a word of English. And I don't speak Korean. But with a little bit of drinking, we did it all. Uh, 
So the, the, the four details has to do essentially with a granite uh, sidewalk that goes through the building, a uh, storefront system that involves vertical striation, a plaster detail that embeds all of that junk that is over your head into single stripes. Every black stripe on the ceiling represents an opportunity for HVAC, sprinkler system, lights, etc. And a horizontal louver system on top, which has nothing to do with the control of light, but rather the concealment of the impossibility of craft on a compound curvature that they insisted on. To, to maintain the objecthood of what uh, this building engendered. So conceptually, uh, the building operates as uh, a, a monolith overhead that is suspended down. Everything comes down. The staircases come down to meet the ground. The columns are suspended from the ceiling. The skylights do not touch the ground. And the tectonics that this entails is uh, immaterial. Uh, it has none of the signs of, of, of construction. It is like a rhino model, and once it's complete, uh, it does not um, pretend to be anything else either. And in fact, uh, the project uh, is not badly crafted. It is not well crafted. It is exactly what you would imagine it to be. And, uh, and so in some sense, it delivers on the kind of abstraction that requires the maximum tolerances that this grain can offer you. The one moment of transformation, of course, that we had was also to embed a sectional relationship with the ramp that goes down into the parking in the basement, the auditorium, and the excavation of the proscenium of that auditorium to not only connect with the gallery outside, but also the landscape beyond. And somehow that was one of the programmatic activations that would turn this open hypostyle hall that is the base of the building uh, to include columns, but also include programs embedded in these massive monolithic columns that were not only the auditorium, but also uh, rooms that could be uh, rented out for conferences, cafes, galleries, and a basic open space that connects the park to the city. The graining of the, of the, uh, of the base also has to do with a spacing that uh, uh, is more uh, generous on the south, but with fritting, uh, on the east and west with deeper blades to protect from the sun, and the north a more generic open space. Uh, but a typological predisposition that involves a domino frame that is bullioned at the corners and then masked with a skin, uh, a kind of three-dimensional organic figure against the rectangular towers of the, of the skyline of the city, and a base that is in essentially a topographic base that produces a, its own skyline in dialogue with the mountainous terrain of Seoul. The sum total of which uh, becomes a figure that we not so much designed, but reacted to according to daily battles that we had online in WebEx. You have to imagine that this project from beginning to end is one year and six months. And so at any given moment, that shape may change and you still have to be happy with it. So what we were developing was uh, not only the grain of the detail, but ground rules that at any moment may go against your aesthetic predispositions. And so the rules of the game are somehow embedded in this drawing, in this animation, with the skin of teas and mullions cascading to the ground, uh, programs from below surging up, programs from uh, uh, the top pushing down, and organizing that vertical grain against the base of the skyline, the louvers landing on top and opening windows, winking out to the skyline uh, beyond in only those areas where there's public spaces because the rest of it is essentially a black box stage set where about 20 apartments uh, are placed. This uh, 
this preoccupation then with striping and graining comes in very different configurations based on whether you're dealing with the pixels of brick uh, or with the striations of a storefront system. And when we were asked to consider to build the bridge between the Yara River and the uh, Tennis Open uh, in Melbourne, uh, we were interested in figuring out how to develop a structural system rooted in the principle of redundancy such that we could take exposed rebar and through triangulation and a modulation of the width of that rebar to do everything with one medium. And by doing that, in a sense, uh, the graining of that um, bridge in relationship to the triangulation of the truss that is produced from it is also becomes a vehicle to wrap around the railing and extend above to become the lighting. This kind of maniacal uh, insistence on uh, the kind of monomedium mono is a trope that you will see in, in many projects, but it has to do with the um, impulse to make materials do what they really don't want to do. And, but also excavating out of that medium how to radicalize its tectonic grain. And in this case, understanding how rebars are bent and how they're figured uh, is an important one to, to understand how it wraps the belly and how we might come to terms with the hierarchies of members as we navigate the maximum moment of the bridge in its longest span and how that may become the fifth elevation of this important condition because essentially the bridge above is empty uh, you know, 90% of the year. It's only during the tennis open when you know, tens of thousands of people are on top of that plane. The majority of the year, everybody's below the bridge because the Yarra River Park is uh, an immense uh, and important landscape that uh, navigates the entire waterfront and connects back to downtown Melbourne. And so these striations become uh, a mechanism by which uh, the landscape of the base is mirrored in a reflective ceiling plan uh, that uh, characterizes uh, this fifth facade. Uh, this idea of graining then is somehow something that you've witnessed and discovered in many technologies and many uh, cultural denominations. In this case, for the New England house, uh, we wanted to produce a structure that is born out of a vernacular, the Borden Batten system, which uh, must have some uh, presence in, in this part of the country as well, as well as a tongue and groove system to the left where the louvers are. But this is one of those structures where the striping of the batten produces a shadow and a grain to it, uh, from which, uh, through which we can conceal the garage doors at the base, but delaminate it such that the handles that get into the garage are somehow uh, unwound from that same tectonic system. Now, if you consider the idea of that vertical graining as something of significance, then you also appreciate that um, wood construction isn't just wood construction. Uh, a wood uh, picket fence is not the same as uh, louvers. Uh, a tongue and groove system is not the same as board and batten. A framed window is not the same as a paneled wall. But in this rendition uh, of this wall for the New Hampshire house, uh, everything is in wood, yes, and everything is vertically striated, yes, but it represents a hybrid technology because we're bringing tectonics that would not normally go together uh, into one utterance. Um, I'm not sure why this is here, but eventually I'll, it, it must be out of order, but I'll, uh, we'll get to that. But it has something to do with uh, the idea of figuration not only being important to us, uh, but also the dangers that, that somehow underlie it. Uh, everybody here is well aware, well aware of the traditions that produced 
architecture parlance and the ability for architecture to speak uh, or its legibility as a figure, uh, but also the dangers of kitsch that underlie it uh, to the right. Um, and somehow this narrative is, is related to all of these projects because they're not innocent and, uh, and certainly they're not natural, but that all of this discussion about graining in some way or other is about the configurative breakdown of projects, the grammar, the syntax that it involves, but the figures have something to do with something that's larger than the sum of their parts in the way that they operate as icons and as legible entities. In this case, uh, this is a student project actually I did at the GSD many, many years ago, but uh, I still love it today because of that part to whole relationship. For whatever reason, I was absolutely obsessed with the marketplace in the center of Florence and this big hypostyle hall of arched openings with all of the little furniture underneath it. Uh, and I wanted to produce this large table that covered all of these miniature tables underneath it. And it has that kind of resonance of Romulus and Remus underneath the, the, the she-wolf, uh, which is a very tender image. Uh, and so, but you have to get into another kind of discourse to understand why I like dogs so much and all of that. But there, there is a, there's an element of uh, zoomorphism that is involved in, in this that uh, was very important to me. And somehow I had constructed in my mind a connection between Rome and Boston because Rome is the city of seven hills and so was Boston before they flattened every hill to make the landfill. And so this a monument here was taking the elevation of one of those hills in the south end. But back to the discussion about figurations and configurations, the figure of the table is constructed literally out of the precast elements of those tables underneath it. And the strange skin condition that you see syncopating up the legs of this are really the objectification of the landings of the stair as they go up and disrupt the normality of a, what would have otherwise been a grid. So this um, preoccupation with figuration is, of course, connected to an idea about uh, anthropomorphism, zoomorphism. And I, what I like about that era of architecture parlante is not the iconographic or the semantic alone, but that somewhere lurking in there is this ghost of performativity. So it, as you look at the shoulder blades of the elephant here, uh, maybe it's not by accident that you know, the figure produces an arch. There, there's a collusion between uh, the natural predisposition of an arch and the way that the body of the elephant works. It's also uh, not uh, a, a bad accident that the fountain is produced by the snout of the elephant, and so forth. So uh, in our work, then, there is constantly this oscillation between an understanding of uh, both the inductive and deductive lines of reasoning. When you know the answer in some instances, and you're looking for all of the evidence to make up that answer, and sometimes when you're just playing and don't know what you're going to discover along the way. In the context of the New Hampshire House, if you allow me to go back, we were confronted with this tremendous view uh, over the presidential mountain range where you're looking at Mount Washington to Mount Lincoln, and we wanted to build a prefab house that would, with each room looking at each of these uh, heads uh, of, each, of each of these mountains. And essentially, typologically, it's a, a pretty regular uh, building type, uh, panoptic or a circular courtyard on the one hand with rooms uh, systemically looking out, but also because of the interstitial spaces between them, a dog truck house so that it's connecting an inner court with the outer court. And so it's a, it's a combination of a stoa and a dog trot as it organizes itself. Um, so as a series of prefab rooms, they're arranged uh, around the periphery of the site, each looking at uh, one mountain. God forbid Trump be uh, the next one of them. And uh, 
uh, a series of anomalous and strange interstitial spaces between them that create the privacy of the porch next to the bedroom or the service area next to, next to the kitchen, uh, 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 you know, the central deck for the living room and so forth. Uh, and the conditions of a room being relatively normative and uninventive. But as you begin to encounter the relationship between the inside and the outside, uh, you come to appreciate that there's something bigger at stake in relationship to the overall uh, figure of the building. And there's something that, in my mind, has been completely lost in education today uh, for all of the right and wrong reasons, if you like. And that is the, with the kind of discovery of the agency of 3D modeling, the, the ways in which the plan can still operate in, in critical ways. And in this sense, if you think about these as prefabricated units, it would make impossible the idea of grafting them or fusing them together. So the architecture of this structure, I like to think, is the, in that interstitial space where it all fuses together. And that uh, requires a completely different way of thinking to bring it together. In the context of this plan also, you enter uh, uh, on that side under this archway that brings you all the way in here. But that promenade takes you through the whole house and to, on the end side brings you up a deck going over the original entry. And so that promenade forces you to encounter each of these rooms and the ways that uh, the, the life of the house is both extroverted and introverted. It looks out onto the mountains, but also has this protected space where uh, essentially the, the, the mountain lions and the bears of, of northern New Hampshire uh, are no longer there. So the, figure, if you like, the belly of this beast is really the result of the figure of the stair going up uh, the building and creating that very threshold through which you have to enter in order to um, uh, gain access to the building uh, and demonstrating essentially the versatility of the vertical grain in its, in its ability to navigate the X, Y, and Z dimension, because essentially it is a ruled surface, broken down into a series of lines. So the volumetric relationship with the surficial uh, is bound in a kind of social contract where they have to come together. The part to whole relationship ensures that continuity and essentially creates the, uh, the ability to connect uh, the building as an entire idea uh, with the building as a discrete set of tectonic grains coming into coordination uh, with each other. For those of you who appreciate plans like I do, then you also probably appreciate the genealogies to which it refers. On the one hand, the difficulties uh, that uh, Sterling had in uh, uh, stuffing his buildings, as it were, in Berlin, uh, what I call taxidermy. Um, uh, Kahn was much more resourceful and, uh, and clever in the way that the collisions of the confetti produce oblique, almost medieval conditions of connection, uh, forcing one-point and two-point perspectives to play off of each other. Uh, and I'm interested in that much more than, than, than the former, but also in the confluence of forms in the way that Sharoon or Hugo Herring would play off in making sure that there's a sense of ambiguity between when the beginning of one thing is and when the end of the other is. And so uh, even though it's res less representable, there is something about the architecture of this liminal space in which uh, we were invested as we were taking on this project. The, the foundation and the roof of this uh, are neutral then. They do not participate in the, in the game and, and are only there as platforms on which to stand or to amplify the seasons as the, as the, uh, the snow sits on them. Um, now, sometimes the graining does not allow the kind of synthesis that a project like New Hampshire entails. 
And, uh, you know, one of the unfortunate things that happens to practices is that you lose a lot of competitions. And we're uh, on such a losing streak right now that I'm, I'm getting used to it. And so uh, part of that, the mourning process of these, this loss is to just present it to you and then you can weigh in on it to say whether I should ever present it again or not. But uh, this uh, competition of a few months ago is for the uh, Seoul Cinematheque on a site next to a back alley like this of no civic importance, uh, a very tight site that involved the imperative of stacking three or four cinema spaces on top of each other with administration spaces and maybe an outdoor theater at the top uh, with very limited views to the surrounding areas until you get up beyond a certain level where you have this amazing panoramas over the city. And so, this was one of those opportunities with a relatively low budget, I should say, that we had to imagine uh, different organizations of theaters uh, and exper experimental spaces with a tight core with an understanding that we're going to invest, well, essentially in the wrong decision, to navigate around the periphery of this thing uh, in order uh, to take stock of the majesty, which is the skyline of Seoul. And in, 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 in the process, you're also discovering new programs on this promenade of the spiral. And so there's no innocence here either. Uh, much like the other figurative images I've shown you, the kinds of references that came into mind were not only the uncoiled uh, stacks of film uh, before the digital era, uh, but the kind of double helical circulatory systems and the way that that could be made legible on a, uh, on, on a script that is on the external uh, uh, surface of the building as it goes up. The problem, of course, is that as you stack up all these theaters, they can't align with each other because nothing is at the same slope and sometimes there's flat levels and sometimes there's this and that. And so in working with what for us was the most economical means, essentially corrugated extruded metal, this became an uh, opportunity to uh, inflect that wrapping, uh, but always aligning it with one of those ramps, one of those stairs, one of those auditoria, and then uh, uh, making it normal again in relationship to another level. And so this reciprocity uh, between the inside and the outside is another ethic that you will see in a lot of our work. Um, in other words, uh, there is no option but to confront this ethic of dealing with the architecture as an organic and holistic problem. Now, luckily for us, the building type uh, is essentially a black box with moments of porosity or moments of perforation as you're going up. And so many of the public spaces uh, can be uh, put sporadically here and there. And so while much of the public elements are at the base, the top entails some spaces like the library, which uh, has limited access for the public and uh, uh, produces the possibility for a, a prospect, a smoking balcony, an area for research that also engages in the very skyline that I've described in the previous projects. Um, but the idea that a building like this has two lives, uh, one in the day and one at night, and that it has this possibility of uh, becoming uh, uh, rekindled with another life as uh, the dark sets in and it uh, has the possibility of becoming a night theater with other movies that may happen was very much part of the kind of coiling and uncoiling of this skin that uh, acquires a kind of depth as you begin to understand the organization of the building that projects itself out onto the organization of the city very much entrapped in a fabric at the same time trying to escape it and uh, untether itself from the very context in which it's situated. 
So it's no secret now that there are these two predicaments uh, that architects have. Uh, there is the architect on the left who is uh, very certain about uh, the forms that he or she wants to produce uh, and the bowl uh, while being pristine and platonic and, and idealized in the way it is uh, obviously has a molecular structure, an aggregate structure that has been erased in, in its description because of the smoothing out of the surface. But the nest is really no different than what you see from the left, but its aesthetic predisposition is to articulate the very means by which it's, it's constructed. In that sense, the part to whole relationship is always in evidence. And most of our work um, uh, confronts uh, what's on the right-hand side. Uh, and so when we were asked to do a pavilion for the uh, Guangzhou Biennale, a permanent pavilion, as a gateway to the uh, old city, we imagined this tensegrity structure that would span and cantilever in two directions, which is a kind of magical thing. And anybody who knows Snelson's structures appreciates the way that the compressive members seem to float in space because you, you, the eye is trained not to see the tensile members. And so this uh, tectonic trope is one of those magical things that, that we wanted to tap into. And we did a nice thick set of working drawings. We got it in a week early, and they said they loved it. They said, we love it, but do you mind if we replace all of your tensile members with compressive elements? And we thought about it for a while. And because it's a, a Korean way, uh, a polite Korean way of saying your project is dead, uh, <laughs> we responded, is it a problem for us to change the form of the project to make them all compressive if we get it into you within five days? They said, it's absolutely fine. So what we did then is we did exactly the opposite of everything I've shown you uh, to this point. We said, okay, we'll design a figure and a formwork for that figure, and we'll design the densities of this tectonic grain, but they won't actually have to follow any working drawings or no stick, or no, no, no steel rod has to go in any particular way. And I'll explain that to you in a second. The overall figure is this oval. It has to navigate around two existing trees and infrastructure underneath. We add in an oculus in the middle there just to lighten the load and make less material. The rods that you see in space were donated to the project by the owner of the Lock and Key Museum there, who, uh, who owns a steel factory. And he's an amazing person, uh, a friend, a common friend of Jude's and myself, uh, Halim Su, who made this project uh, uh, happen and effectively donated all of these door handles to the project. The only rule that we gave them was to follow the formwork that you see on the right and produced uh, through a program the densities that would require to create ample compressive strength on the columns. Uh, triangulation, of course, for lateral stability, uh, a spreading of the units in the capital, and of course, a lightening of the truss above, uh, so that uh, essentially it spans, but it spans in the most optimal way. So this, uh, this kind of messy nest, this maze, that you see in this project is really the result of a the design of a set of constraints that have absolutely nothing to do with the kinds of specifications that you and I uh, are used to making in the, uh, uh, in the designation of materials and matter on the x, y, and z axis. It is no secret that uh, we have been doing these kinds of material explorations over the years, but the Ventulet chair became a turning point. Uh, for my former partner, Monica Ponce de Leon, there's still the cascading plywood uh, out, out there. Uh, in my case, the, uh, the, I forget the name, the change of state installation uh, that is uh, depicted here 
uh, was a, a critical moment and a shift of my emphasis from uh, architecture to engineering. I say that with humor because it's the one exam I still haven't passed. Um, but that these installations became a kind of uh, architectural amuse-bouche that would connect what we do as research in schools with what we do out there in the world. As I look at these structures, I've always been fascinated by others' works. Uh, Siza, uh, in his expo structure, uh, what is seemingly suspended like a sheet of fabric, is in fact concrete uh, in suspension, a kind of magical structure. Clearly, we are indebted to uh, not only uh, this as an artifact, but its, its, uh, its tectonic suspense. We're also interested in those moments of opportunism where the idea of a maximum moment is then inhabited with a typology for which it was not conceived. In Kahn's case, the spanning of, of the Grand Canal in Venice becomes the opportunity of an amphitheater space that inhabits that belly of the maximum moment. It is no secret that the optimization of arches in Barcelona come from their inversion, the suspended catenary chains that produce uh, you know, the possibility of form finding. And that, uh, by people like Axel Killian, have become the means by which we may yet again invert that tectonics by opposing a completely different question. Instead of suspending structure as they naturally would, in this case for an installation made out of uh, paper clips, we asked ourselves what would it mean to make a compressive catenary? Uh, those of you who recognize this structure will be fascinated by what seems to be a normative vault is actually this, the archway in the crypt of the Escorial outside of Madrid. Here, the keystone that would be in the center of the oculus is not the only keystone moment. In fact, because that's a flat floor slab, it does not vault in the way that you would optimize the shape of a vault, and so that every stone is being keystoned at an angle all the way down as it goes down. So, uh, there's a keystone here, and every stone after that is angled to such a degree that um, it is able to withstand the forces of its inevitable uh, failure. So we wanted to develop a suspended structure on which you can stand. We have, of course, played around with the idea of the reality of structure and the fictions it produces. Uh, here, as an extension of our fascination with uh, end grain plywood, we produced this uh, chest of drawers that essentially uh, house anywhere from pants to sweaters to jewelry at the top, but wanted to create a structure, an architectural structure, if you like, that has the kind of composure of the weight of a palazzo, embedding the structure within the seams of the drawers so that it's invisible, but most uh, uh, scandalously produces the possibility of these kind of edge conditions of cantilever where you don't even know how this entire thing is, is, uh, is brought bare to structure. And so these kinds of moments of magic that are embedded in tectonics also has to do with a, a recognition that tectonics is not about the revelation of truth, but that you know, there's always a fiction in tectonics because it, it has to do with your, um, your ability to deceive and to construct perception as much as it is to convey the way that it operates. And so for this structure, uh, the, the development of puzzle pieces, essentially, that produce the keystoning moments becomes a systemic way by which we embed all of these self-similar units uh, that then uh, get locked into Corian pieces. These are high-density foam pieces that you can stand on with uh, Corian pieces that connect to the I-beams on the roof. And essentially, instead of the keystone, you get the void of the oculus where there is no structure. And the compound curvature of the, 
a vault on the outside because that's a CNC routable, whereas the inside is all faceted because it has to be um, cut on a flatbed. All of these experiments are linked somehow together. They are linked to each other, and by the way, they're linked to the exhibition upstairs. Uh, first with the Hinman on the left, then with the um, Melbourne School of Design in the middle, and then finally, uh, in a different way, connected to the Daniels building on the right. And I'll try to go relatively fast on these because they really have to do with uh, the key structural systems. Here, the hammock, I believe is what you call it, is the key moment, uh, a kind of repurposing of the gantry crane, was a critical way in which um, that came together. In the Melbourne School of Design, uh, the idea was really to create a, design, a dedicated design studio space for a building that never had none, or a program that never had one. In the early phases, it became clear that they couldn't afford a studio space. So we carved the, uh, the studio space out of, out of the circulatory zone of corridors around the atrium by simply diminishing the size of the atrium and expanding the balconies by an extra five feet, making nine, 10 foot spaces of circulation that rob spaces to their left and right by making a vertical studio. Within that, the roof system that you just saw has a suspended studio uh, for the visiting critics, only they get a uh, dedicated studio space, uh, and much like the Georgia project, becomes the means by which uh, this element is produced. Now, this is, of course, in dialogue with a large history of other artifacts in which I am so invested. In the Tempietto, this idea of uh, this monumental temple miniaturized as a model of St. Peter's locked into this courtyard, incarcerated almost, uh, uh, and miniaturized is, is almost a folly. Uh, and yet you can see the figure ground relationship between that as an artifact and the fabric around it. In Kahn's case in New Haven, you can see the way in which uh, a, a relatively normative fire stair is clad over by concrete, uh, concealing its scale and monumentalizing it as this anonymous, uh, monumental, uh, and uh, silent uh, uh, totem. Uh, and of course, in what I think of as Frank Gehry's maybe best building, uh, is the the uh, the zoomorphic figure of the of the, the monster uh, inside what is uh, Gary's maybe most minimal and silent building on the outside, the fabric of which is, is extraordinary. Uh, what we wanted to do was extend this tradition but break it with one key element. How do you conjoin the fabric and the icon in one single move? And we wanted somehow to develop a structural system of laminated uh, timber uh, members that span 22 meters with coffers that are rotated to allow for natural light but no, no direct sunlight to go in there and then invert the kind of traditional tectonics by putting the weight of structure above and as this thing suspends down the wood becomes thinner and thinner until it becomes blade-like and plywood-like at the very bottom to produce coffers for an acoustic, uh, acoustic space underneath it. So it's a kind of inverted rustication using the depth of inhabitable structure at the top with the kind of levity of what lies underneath it to maintain the flexibility of the floor space, much like you have here for exhibitions, for lectures, for Beaux-Arts balls, and, 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 and the rest of it. And the kind of torque that is given to the figure of this is also has to do with the idea that not only you need access to it, it needs to lean to one side to, to be uh, tangent with the balconies, but also gain its lateral stability from that very connection. But the tectonics at work are also something extraordinary, that you're going from massive timber pieces above 
to plywood on the other side. And so you can even feel the emphasis of weight at the top as you occupy some of the studio bases and you'll peer into the studio spaces and the skylight and see the veneers of wood as they come down and they extend to the bottom. And then as you get to the bottom, you realize that that entire surface becomes perforated, not only for acoustic reasons, but to gain some porosity to inside spaces and then become as thin as a flake at the bottom where the acoustic baffles are then organized in relationship to sprinkler systems, lighting systems, and, and the like. So as we migrated then from Melbourne to Spadina Circle in Toronto, we were confronted with this uh, incredible building, a neo-Gothic uh, structure on the south uh, side of Spadina uh, Circle, uh, Knox College, uh, to try to urbanize it, but with all of its cellular, cellular spaces inside of it, extended by a large and monumental and dedicated studio space in the north, and make a, a, a program that's dedicated to architecture, urbanism, and landscape, literally speak to those three disciplines by extending the architecture of it all the way outside and opening up the pores and the slits of the building to the very edges of the building so that the promenade around it makes for a safe space for crossing to the other sides. This building is just uh, being completed right now with the uh, last touches. Though a very standard and compact box, uh, it, it looks like just a monolith that's been attached to it, conceptually the building is very much a landscape building. As you see on the north side, the ground of Spadina North coming into the basement of the Fab Lab, how the southern side goes to a southern deck and you know, gains access to uh, a cafe space on that side. And then most importantly, the delamination of the studio on the top of the building to bring natural light into the auditorium and the delamination of, of the skylights of the roof, the topic for this lecture, uh, becomes the means by which structure daylighting and hydrology come into a kind of critical synthesis. And that is for this space, which is the only space that is a long span structure. The rest of the building is a standard concrete structure, off the shelf, relatively rough, uh, but with this idea of this vast uh, surface active structural system that spans 110 feet to maintain the kind of flexibility of a studio space on top producing a prospect for Spadina Circle. The problem was, as is usual and normative, the, uh, the contractor said, you don't know how to build a building. Uh, this is $1 million over, and it's unbuildable. So we were confronted with building a model and sending it to them to make, make sure they understand it so that they know uh, that it's buildable. And they said, thank you very much. We know that you know how to build a model, but this is not a building. So then on one of my trips to uh, uh, Melbourne, I called the office, uh, and we have a kind of fab lab component within our office, and much like the staff that came and, and made this exhibition possible, uh, we built this structure in one week. And really, for you, it's not any magic. The only difference is this, is that instead of doing it in concrete, we said, what happens if we change the structure from concrete to steel and make it more economical by demonstrating to them that under the steel we can create a series of light gauge steel structures that are basically ribs and have gyp board uh, uh, on them and show that it's a developable surface, it's a ruled surface. Later we also realized that there is a product out there that can make a radiant panel for that, uh, for plaster. And so in fact, you can get your heating from the concrete at the base, but you're cooling above. You're sandwiched between different seasons there. And that saved us $800,000. To get us to this point, which uh, admittedly is a transition from the concrete system of construction to the steel as you go up to this space, uh, the plastering, uh, which is a, a, a pretty typical process of plastering to bring you to this uh, space that is now uh, uh, 
occupied uh, in a much more uh, spectacular way than, than this image would, uh, would betray. Because in fact, as pure as the roof is, as cluttered and, and messy the ground is, the, it, the better it looks. Um, this idea of the ruled surface, of course, has taken on different grains within other projects. And this project also, uh, uh, on the cusp of being complete, is one of those small projects that in invariably ends up being one's favorite project. Uh, so I, I wanted to end with these two house projects just to show the connections also between some of the larger ideas and their smaller instantiations. But I am very much invested in the dumbness of certain typologies, like the courtyard. And as they come to confront uh, a topographic condition like a hill, how they are able to navigate it by uh, doing things that sectionally connect them together. In this case, the swimming pool is in that space with all of the public programs on top and the bedrooms below it and the pool becoming the, the mechanism to conjoin them. But it's a demonstration of the mutability of type and its flexibility and the way in which the, the view towards the Mediterranean may yield other views towards the west where the trees are and where the shade is. And how all of a sudden by this slippage in section, the corners become implicated because that's where the stairs would go. And these stairs are no longer just for circulation, but they become the main structure of the building. Because the landscape is not around the building. The landscape is embedded in the building, inserted into the building, and part of its promenade as it goes up through the inner courtyard and outside uh, into the living room and back up into the hills. So what seems to be a front facade is actually a beam. And as you go inside the house and appreciate the kind of panorama of this uh, almost case study house, you come to terms with the idea that the span of this vault is not actually the short span, much like the Kimball, it's the long span. So as we excavate the view on the western side, you come to realize that the concrete roof, much like uh, the uh, Canadian project, uh, is the means by which we uh, develop a kind of incremental loggia or colonnade in relationship to the pool, but a monumental relationship to the pinus pinei, which are to the right-hand side. Opening up more discrete views and appreciating the kind of majesty of the, of the canopies that lie just uh, west of those rooms, but also understand the ways in which the building is implicated in its structural grain. The, it's not just the stair, it's also the swimming pool wall that you see here that penetrates the master wing to support uh, the cantilever that is extended uh, beyond there. That wall of the swimming pool is the wall of the bedroom that divides the office space from, from, uh, from the sleeping area and becomes the, the, the basis for uh, its architecture. It's also, a, there's a grand difference, of course, in working with aggregate material like shingles and slats of wood and so forth and concrete. And the concrete is a liquid medium and its expression being either the result of form work or, uh, or post-construction manipulation. And we, we've always appreciated the kind of uh, surplus of expression that is the result of fabric form work. And we asked ourselves, what are the modalities of tectonics we can work with? to, uh, to um, uh, expose the tectonic grain. If it were in the form work, well then we could CNC route a whole range of effects that would bring in the rustication of the stone of the French landscape right into the interior of the building. And, and it's not that I don't like this, but it's, there's something not yet satisfying about it because it's purely representational. So we said, okay, well, if we think about a different modality, and how do we bring in the aggregate nature of that material and make it smooth like a silky wall for paintings, but also the stone of the landscape at the same time? What if we panelize the pores and embed the aggregate in it as part of it, such that 
the walls on the interior are actually smooth, but then in different pores begin to embed in flat casts on the ground different aggregates such that the figure ground relationship between stones and concrete become inverted by the time you actually have the stone walls that extend up and become to define the property at its edges. This is a few months ago and you're beginning to see on the smooth side the, the natural grain of the wood that is participant in giving voice uh, to uh, the smooth tectonics. I want to end quickly with this project that we're strategizing right now. We've just built the artist studio and now the main structure of, of this house has this predicament of grain actually, but it's, an, it's a kind of environmental grain. The view is on the west, uh, and so they want the length of the house pointing west, but the sun is on the south and where you get your, your best energy. And so the, uh, they wanted a, essentially a, a uh, deep plan, almost like a shotgun, and, uh, and we've developed a, an approach to the shotgun that in, uh, involves a, a kind of, maybe I have to click again, yes, it involves a, uh, a kind of transformation of that plan into a seamless diagonal such that uh, the public spaces on the voided side uh, are then uh, compensated for, for the bedroom and the family room and the bathrooms on the opposing side, while the roof is actually going in the opposing direction. So now you have a cross grain, a kind of X that crosses out the house uh, as it goes in two directions. The plan is going in one direction, the roof is going in the other direction, and uh, uh, as a building, uh, uh, it produces a kind of structured proscenium by which the continuity of an open glass house, if, if you like, uh, is has the service spaces that Philip Johnson's never had. So the living room is on the south with the chimney, the kitchen next. The dining, of course, is right next to it. The entry is next at the center of the house. It's, it's carved into the main entry. Uh, you go down and then you pass into the library, the second bedroom. And finally, at the end of the space is the bedroom. And it's essentially, it's an open loft. Meanwhile, notice that uh, on the left-hand side, on the west and on the south, the glazing goes to the top at, at around 14 feet. And the roof is raking down in the opposing direction, producing a kind of perspectival con condition that uh, uh, produces this conical house, a kind of forced perspective uh, but cross-eyed somehow going in two directions. So as you come back out uh, from this interior, uh, you come to realize that also as part of this they want hybrid spaces, outdoor spaces. So the mirroring of that living room to the outdoors not only produces some shelter for the cars in the snow, but also a porch that then uh, uh, is shaded on the right-hand side, but a deck that's exposed to the west uh, on the left-hand side. And all of this supports uh, a more basic idea about the roof being a huge collector uh, of, uh, of all of the rains and the snows, uh, uh, the water of which is then uh, brought into the cistern uh, on the north edge uh, at the opposing end and uh, collected for, for the consumption of the house. This is in uh, northwestern Connecticut and is a very basic uh, commitment to an idea about a, an elemental structure which is no more than 1,200 uh, uh, square feet on, on the interior. And so the idea is that 
uh, we will also build the structure, uh, the framing. Uh, after the concrete is done, our office will build the structure and, and, and complete it uh, at a very low budget. Um, I end with these ruminations about uh, the tectonic grain and uh, my unfortunately late discovery about why the Roman streets are fabricated the, the, the way that they were. Uh, you're certainly not vaulting anything on the ground, so why make arches on the ground? But I realized that somehow as you set your two knees down on the ground and begin to uh, lay down the stone, there's a kind of reach of a, a single person that then gets displaced in the multiple rainbows that it produces. And our, our commitment and entrapment by the human body and its relationship to uh, construction goes, you know, some uh, hundreds, uh, sometimes thousands of years, even to the, the kind of uh, ways in which we have uh, produced the creative efforts of tagging subway cars and things like that. But we're going through an interesting moment right now because uh, of 3D printing and a range of other digital protocols that uh, not only overcome the traditional seams of tolerances and construction joints, but possibly uh, the agencies of what happens in laminar construction that we take so much for granted. What happens if we're able to print out different uh, constituent elements within the wall such that the insulation, the vapor barrier, the, the cladding uh, becomes more synthetic? And that would suggest uh, a completely different kind of lecture. Uh, and maybe it would uh, re-establish a completely different discussion about uh, this uh, uh, predicament that I've had with the grain for, for 20 years uh, that goes back to this Greek structure. It's always a kind of amazing when you realize, sometimes late in one's education, that the triglyphs of the temple are a petrification of the wood members that logically embed themselves, encrypted, in the face of the building. And this has something to do with our own ethical commitment of giving that reciprocity between the interstices of the building and its expression. But that turning of the corner produces a kind of astonishing moment where you don't know where you're being duped or whether you've misunderstood that ethic all to begin with. Because as it turns the corner, not only do you realize that you've been deceived because those triglyphs are no longer the embodiment of that structure, but in fact, it's a moment where you realize that the structure of the building is in the, ser in the service of its surface. And the tectonics and the tectonic grain has to do with this delicate balancing act between realities and fictions. Uh, all of which is, is uh, mutable and comes to terms with this difficult moment where you turn the corner. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot for, uh, for coming. Uh, I've, I've seen you lecture a few times and I really appreciate it. Uh, glad that the microphone Took a little while to get down because I had to roll my tongue back into my mouth. My mouth, but um, I, it's the first time that I've seen you be so referential uh, to plans and to architecture uh, as a discipline, um, uh, of images and like hi history and and I'm just I'm I'm thinking about uh, your place right now at uh, at Cooper and what's happening right now in architecture with sort of objects for their own objectness uh, and how they reference other objects. Uh, I wonder, it, it seems like that stuff's always been there. I've seen projects now today that are old, older projects that you're able to weave in plans of old, con, and things like that, but you haven't talked about it. You haven't ex explicated that to us. And I'm just wondering, if it, is it, is it uh, that it's okay now <laughs> that it's okay for us to be referential, or is it is it just this place where uh, you know you're in in the uh, 
in Haydock's old, in, in the building, where you're confronted with a nine square every time you walk into it? It's a loaded question, and uh, I'm prone to be brutal in my response. But essentially, I was educated at a moment in time where our generation rejected the overtness of postmodernism precisely because of its referentiality, not because the references were bad, but because that the, the references became an alibi as if to suggest that they were the crutch and without which you couldn't get uh, the kind of authority of history to endorse your building. And yet your building was absolute shit. And so wh where I came out of that uh, generation was a, a generation of students that were trying to extend the project of modernity. And that's that moment that you saw Rem Koolhaas surge uh, as the kind of hero uh, of that generation. The, what, what I find incredibly astounding by Rem uh, was the way in which he appropriated, absorbed, and inflected those very same histories, but then brushed them under the carpet, hiding his own footsteps. So, but I actually don't, I had no problem with that. I just found him incredibly erudite and opportunistic because I felt that he's uh, an incredibly intelligent and, and uh, scholarly architect. He understands the depth of what not only modernism, but classism, classicism offered him. But he also understood better than I did that um, in order to be a great architect, you have to demonstrate that you're also a magician. You can't reveal your secrets. In, in my case, I feel, uh, and I've always felt this, and I'm surprised that you've never heard me speak about these things, because my main paranoia today in lecturing at all is that I know that everything's recorded. And if you go to YouTube, you've heard the same jokes and the same things that it makes one look bad as when you, when you present these things again. But I felt that it is important to expose the anachronism of the act of architecture insofar as you think that it's important to have a dialogue not only with history but with the future. So it just so happens that these... Uh, buildings are happening in a certain span in time. But if you notice, I did not present chronologically. There are things that are, uh, were done yesterday, and then there's things that were done 20 years ago, and then there were things that were done 10 years ago. But there is a cloud of preoccupations. Some of them hold together as a theme in which we are invested, but some of them are clearly obsessions that uh, others have collected together. So what I like about the turning of the corner is that we can go from the Parthenon, hopscotch from there to the Renaissance, from Bramante to Palladio. We can jump again and, and go to Mies and Alto in very different ways and then jump again uh, to uh, Herzog and de Meuron and Rem and, and know the fundamental differences between them. And I think it's important to... Um, to recognize uh, not references as people, but references as debates and problematics. So in that sense, <clears throat> I want to be clear that uh, uh, there is no apology about uh, the references. If anything, I find my repertoire too narrow. And, and, and you know, you're looking constantly to ask a question in a way that you haven't asked it before, because it'll lead you either to other references or that you have to look in another way, look at other things in order to be able to ask a different question. But your question is also more poignant now because uh, while I was not paying attention, all of a sudden, somewhere between Michigan and UCLA and Harvard, everybody has this renewed preoccupation with uh, postmodernism, the, the role of the icon and referentiality. And I'm not embedded in that. I'm kind of the dinosaur of, of that discussion. But I have tried to have a couple of conversations with them, and I haven't understood what they're saying yet. So I feel 
um, I don't know, I, I feel I'm going to let you down by not being able to demonstrate the conversation that I'm literally having with them because I haven't started that yet. They are having their own conversation, but I haven't entered into their conversation yet. But I found, uh, I have read a few things which I found incredibly innocent uh, about that. So, uh, and I don't feel I have a position on what they're doing yet, but I, I would be eager to, to, to do that. But I guess my message to, do, to you is more that I do not, uh, I seek the references for conversation and dialogue, which is an imperative uh, to identify your audience. And my audience, in many cases, is not you, but it's that architect, that uh, Dieste, that did that building, or you know that building that produced that corner condition, because those are the moments that are exciting. And through that, we enter into that conversation together. But certainly not uh, as a mechanism for legitimation, because as you know, Le legitimation is gained in many different ways. Legitimation is gained through uh, popular aggrandizement. Legitimation is also gained through uh, posthumous uh, discoveries. Uh, and legitimation is also made through charisma sometimes. And, and so I, I, I'm very much focused in ingraining this discussion in a disciplinary thing that's slower more obscure to, to most people out there, and then find ways in which the agency of architecture becomes relevant to culture at large. Yes? It's just a footnote of Leland's question about different kinds of temporality and references and so on. There is this other arc, which is your own practice. 35 years into this conversation, you've been doing this. So if I could follow up with a simple question. In your retelling your story at different times, do you find a certain kind of uh, shift or thickening of references to references to associations in your very rhetoric of your retelling of your work, given 35 years now? Um, well, for one, uh, there is a huge shift in our work that happens as a result of just the education of practice that brings to the foreground the, the relative impossibility of doing any good buildings. Uh, because when you're in school and when you're at your desk and when you're making a model, uh, you come out with a kind of certainty of what you think good design is, but you don't realize all of the things that will ruin that design. So one of the discoveries that I made relatively early on was that the most important thing about architecture of the late 20th and early 21st century is the reflected ceiling plan. That's all it is. That's your facade. Because everything that will screw you is up there. This is easy. You know, like that, that fire thing is relatively easy in comparison to all of the stuff that goes on up there. So, uh, it's at that point that I realized that if you solve that problem, the rest will kind of fall in place. Then the next lesson I learned in practice was that you can be a great designer and you can do great things, but you can't get around the problem of pricing because the quantification of the building is done by a builder and only the builder can legally determine the means and methods of what you draw. And so we did two things. One, we got involved in uh, the, the kind of trench warfare of construction, some of it through actual construction. In the, the, the Hookaden for Mantra was our first one, uh, a project that was priced at, I don't remember, $180,000. We built it for 30. Why? Because the the, the contractor knew he could flex his muscles and through, uh, through a, a kind of bullying tactic realized he would win until he realized that that part of the scope of work was taken from him and, and given to us. We had to assume the responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But 
understanding the ownership of means and methods was a critical one. And the way in which that prepared us to behave differently as designers by treating schematic design as a quantity surveying process and as a kind of tactical warfare, as a kind of rear end uh, entry into CD phase was a critical second thing. The third thing was, and related to both of these, was what is the percentage of buildings that goes into engineering? You know, by the time you've done the structure and the mechanical systems, you know, you've lost you know, over 50% of your budget. And so if you design the wrong structure or the wrong environmental systems, uh, you've lost your mojo already. And so, uh, and those were actually all of the classes that I cut. And, and those are all of the classes that I have not passed to this day but became the, the means by which uh, my scholarship, at least, expanded in the last 15 years. And so from those projects from bank restaurant to some of the other kind of interiors that you see, they seem like projects of surface and decoration, but they're actually the, the, the kind of recalibration of, of where is the, the money in relationship to these indispensable pieces. But it's also quite, it's an issue of perception. If you tell a client that, look, this is all structure and mechanical. That's all it is. And, and so you, you've lodged the architectural idea in the structure and the mechanical system, and then all of a sudden you've... So, and, and, and the fourth part is coming full circle, is that imagine that everything I've said in my answer to you is a lie, but it's a good story, right? So it's also about the control of the narrative. That... Uh, what we learned in school and the way that we learned to tell a story as we're giving a presentation remains as powerful uh, when you want to tell a lie to uh, a city, an academic group, or, or, or a, a contractor. Because part of the poker game that is being played in the Daniels building with the impossibility of build, building an arch, uh, building the vault, is about uh, bully tactics. Somebody says, I, you can't build this. And you say, no, I can't build this. It, it's, it's really uh, the, the kind of playground bullying that happens constantly, but at a professional level. And so your ability to not only tell a story, but to tell it with the kind of rhetorical persuasion that is necessary, that is backed up by fact, uh, is, is an important one because when you get undressed, there better be some substance behind that. Uh, because you will get undressed when it's too, too expensive or, or when it doesn't work. So I think there's something very interesting about exiting from architecture, not because you're leaving architecture, but you're entering into the fields of engineering and environmental sustainability at large, because they also Will, they will make you interested in different icons and different surfaces as a result of that. And, you know, if you read the news and, and recognize that what was predicted to be a kind of environmental disaster by uh, 2100 is now all of a sudden 2030, uh, you begin to come to reckon with, well, what is it that we're doing when construction is one of the main causes of you know, the carbon, the global car, carbon footprint, you, you say, okay, it's, it's not my building that's going to save the world, but it's all of the policies that, uh, that surround urbanization, suburbanization, and the construction footprint at large. And so that will tend to make you behave differently altogether. And you don't confuse that with, you know, the rhetoric of turning of a corner. You, you understand that there's a relative relationship between them. But I think that these things change the way that you speak. And I guess the last point I would say only is that if all of our discourses um, and narratives seem fictional, there is that moment where if we as architects Want, to, want a seat at the table of policy, then it is important to demonstrate the agency of formal operations, 
spatial operations and material operations in their, f in their forming of the world around us and therefore indispensable for the policies that we make. And, and I think that, um, well, few architects are able to do that. And I'm not certainly one of those, but I would want to be that person in 10 to 20 years, if I live that long, to be able to educate myself around what connects and tethers those little things that we do in relationship to a, a kind of larger uh, theme. So I want to ask you to tell us a story, I guess, to go back to this. You mentioned um, kind of how these digital technologies are changing how we construct things. And there's a big conversation here about the kind of atomizing of parts, creating kits of parts that are assembled by various things. Where, at that point, do we look for the grain? Where do we look for that, that, the trace of the, the kind of architect and the plan inside of those methods? As, as they kind of really rewrite the rules of how things go together? Well, you know, the, in, in the world of mass production, I guess you and I inherited the four by eight sheets to, to make it simple, but we, we inherited other things too. The, the, the common brick, the Roman brick, uh, you name it. There are other panelized sizes. And so I guess one of the things that produced the grain of the 20th century was the idea that some of us as architects produce buildings, single buildings, and they're uh, extraordinary icons and, 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 uh, and institutions because they're able to demonstrate the intelligence and the mutability of building types. But others of us also uh, invented kits of parts and behaviors of those kits of parts so that the intelligence of those systems is able to be appropriated by him and her and him and her. And, and I think that uh, there has been a shift. I mean, there have been, let's say there's been swells in the 20th century of that discussion between architecture and prefabrication as, as part of that. Um, but there's you know, a renewed uh, discussion that emerged 20 years ago about uh, mass customization and, and about how uh, that becomes uh, uh, a, a different uh, set of uh, opportunities. But I, I guess it was the work of, you know, the people like Schuyler Tibbetts and, you know, David Benjamin and Neri Oxman, those folks in which I'm not that involved, but it was interesting to come to terms with the idea that if you can actually begin to operate more at a molecular scale, the scale at which we are never asked to, to, to operate, uh, and, and begin to rethink tectonics in biological terms or through the lenses of different disciplines altogether, what would it mean uh, to re rethink the depth of a wall? And where would that seam be between the inside and the outside? What is absolute and clear when you specify the different laminar connections? To that end, I would also ask, when, when and if you're printing the length of the wall, uh, how do you allocate the space of expansion and contraction? So today, you and I uh, allocate that space. For one reason, we know that the steel and the wood are expanding at different rates. But what happens when we think of these terms in more monolithic terms? I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, in answering your question, I can only pose more questions, and that's sort of where I was going at the end, is that uh, what are the limits uh, in, in that discussion? Because there's such fundamental differences about being inside and outside. And for now, we think of insides and, and outsides as an enclosure with the necessity to heat all of it. But in fact, as you know, when you're heating just the floor, knowing that it's the only thing in contact with your body, you know also that the air can be cold, but you, you, you can feel warm. If you molecular, molecularize that discussion, and you say everything can be cold, even the floor, but your body needs to be warm, 
and you isolate uh, uh, an environmental system where it can travel with bodies, it would be a very different kind of discussion because we could live in open air, as it were. So I, I'm interested in the kinds of explorations and technologies that may radicalize the nature of these questions. And it may well be that we're not within five years of those discussions, but the kind of discourses that are operating around smart technologies and, uh, and the material sciences will tend to change the nature of all of these questions uh, and, and reshift them. And I'm not saying that that will change completely the ways in which we bring voice to it or apply rec rhetoric to it or give it uh, uh, a visual reciprocity, but I do think it, it, it changes uh, the way that we speak a language. And I think it's, one of the things I think it's, it's really important in all of this is to recognize, let's say in our generation, you're, you're, you're younger than me, but I'm saying that imagine that I was educated primarily and only in pencil in a way that people have drawn for 500 years. And that in a span of 20 years that we, almost every practice as a literal thing has become obsolete every time, every five years. A, a new program, a new protocol has forced me to become the student of my students. Uh, our own Brandon Clifford of, of Georgia Tech was a, you know, a key vehicle for my education as he came under my tutelage but produced certain things and, and taught me how to draw a different way. So it, it re I can't even begin to tell you uh, the, the kinds of uncertainties that, that lay ahead as we confront some of the new protocols uh, and as the other disciplines bring them into architecture. So uh, unfortunately, I can only give you an answer that is um, embracive of the things that uh, are forthcoming, but can only face with a state of ignorance uh, but a positive ignorance with the possibility that we may change the way that we operate and that we may ask larger ethical questions as a result of them. Why don't we continue this discussion upstairs? We have an exhibition opening, so please, I invite everybody to go upstairs. And, um, thank you. Thank you.